I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and in my travels around Australia, I'm finally starting to see more 300 series Land Cruisers on the road. When the model launched in 2021, Toyota Australia had no supply and the factory was barely making the car due to massive shortages. Very slowly, the situation is improving and more Aussies are taking delivery of the 300 series. And now that we're seeing more of them out there, you might be thinking, should I buy one too? You might be in the wait list right now and thinking about dropping out. So in today's video, I'm going to let you know whether or not you should buy a 300 series Toyota Land Cruiser because these things ain't cheap. The Sahara next to me here is over $140,000 drive away. Is it the trim grade to buy or is there better value to be found? Well, we're going to test everything about the car today. We're going to take it off road. We're going to test it from zero to 100 with its new V6 diesel. We'll also test the braking from 100 to zero, drive on the blacktop, and check out the three row interior of this graphite gray Sahara with the beige leather interior. But before we get started, hit subscribe below. Chasing cars, honest reviews of your next car. Brought to you by Budget Direct. Of course, if you own the previous generation 200 series Land Cruiser, this is going to be unfamiliar because the new version of this iconic four wheel drive has downsized from a V8 to a twin turbo six cylinder engine. Now, of course, Land Cruisers have historically had six pot motors, but we've all gotten used to that V8. And in today's video, we're gonna really test this V6 to see what it's like. Now, I don't have my crystal ball. I left that at home today. So I can't tell you what the reliability of this brand new engine will be like in 20 years from now, but I can tell you how it performs in terms of economy and in terms of outright performance. And I think you're gonna be impressed with some of the figures of this 3,346cc twin turbo diesel V6. All right, so driving the Land Cruiser Sahara, let's start with a bit of off-roading. The off-roading we've got here at our test track, it's kind of mild to a little bit moderate. Um, there are some features that um, will test uh, a vehicle pretty well and you do need like full drive and even a, a rear diff lock at times to achieve all of them. Um, and that's kind of important here because the Sahara, uh, it has a locking center differential, but it doesn't get the locking front or rear diff. You can only get that in Australia on the Land Cruiser um, GR Sport. Um, and that's obviously a very, very popular trim to go for, but it loses the luxury appearance and you don't get a third row. So not everyone wants that, um, but it's important to note that if you don't get that car, um, you don't get a locking rear differential but we still do have fundamentally good off-roading hardware. So ground clearance is 235 millimeters across the range stock. Of course, a lot of people like to modify. The departure angle of 25 degrees is all right. And the approach angle of 32 degrees is acceptable as we found on our little rock climb here, um, particularly compared to the Sahara ZX, which has like a really low front apron so that variant is clearly not designed for going off-road very much of the time at all so the sahara kind of strikes a good middle ground between looking premium and um, being fit for a bit of trail work um, we don't have anything like an air suspension on this car the ride height is fixed and actually the GR Sport is the only model to get EKDSS, Toyota's long running trick suspension. So everything else is um, just passive and, and that works fine. And it's actually a pretty good blend between articulation, capability off-road and comfort on-road as we'll find out in just a moment. So yeah, it's an easy vehicle to pilot on a trail. Visibility is excellent. We've got big mirrors. Um, you can see right over the bonnet there, which is great. We don't have like a see-through underbody view, which would be even more helpful, but we do have a 360 degree camera, um, which can help you see obstacles around the car a little bit better. So um, it's a pretty wieldy tool. Of course, a lot of people do prefer um, a Prado um, if you're gonna do some off-road work because one thing about the 300 series is that it's very, very wide and it feels it on a trail, particularly if you go camping places that have very closed in trees, you're gonna be scratching up your bodywork quite badly in this vehicle. But once you get off the trail, what's it like on the road? Well, 
much more competent than the 200 series. That wasn't that bad to drive, but the 300 series is about 20% stiffer or more rigid than that car, and that's really the way it feels on the blacktop. Its handling is significantly more sophisticated than that of the 200 series, so you can just hold a higher pace on a country road effectively. The steering is still fairly loose really for that maneuverability at low speed, but it weights up a bit as you start to get a little bit faster. And you know, as long as you're patient with the vehicle and you don't expect too much of it, it's gonna give you a decent result. Um, this car's got 22,000 Ks on it. The tires could probably use replacing, uh, so they've been a little bit squealy during my time with the car, but hey, it's a Toyota Land Cruiser. Of course, the really big stuff is under the bonnet, the 3.3 diesel, and it's a very accomplished engine. Um, it's quiet, it actually sounds good when you rev it, um, and you don't really miss the old V8, which, you know, it was big in displacement and um, cylinder count, but it was very breathy. Like it was just, it sounded like it was making more air than power. And the engine is a masterful pairing with Toyota's new 10 speed torque converter automatic. It really keeps the engine in its torque band at all times. In terms of output, you've got 227 kilowatts of power and 700 Newton meters of torque, and that's plenty. Uh, with just me in the car, the zero to 100 sprint is really quick, under 8.2 seconds, which I think is really impressive for a car like this. Going the other way, braking from 100 to zero, it'll do it in under 42 meters. It could be stronger again, but that's a much better performance than some dual cabs out there on the market. And for a vehicle that weighs over 2,700 kilos, once you get me in the driver's seat, I think that's pretty astonishing performance from the brakes, actually. Refinement is also superb. This is a great long distance cruiser. I've done an awful lot of that. I've driven this car from Sydney to Adelaide and back again. It's really quiet at high speed, even on course chip roads. So you can enjoy the reasonable quality of the JBL stereo, even if it has nothing on the Mark Levinson that you get in the Lexus LX version of this car, which is also worth considering if you want a very luxurious Land Cruiser. And you get safety aids as well. Unfortunately, some of them don't really work. Um, so you have rudimentary lane keeping assist by braking in this car, and it definitely does feel rudimentary. Sometimes it works okay, other times it's too annoying and you just turn it off, but the adaptive cruise control is good. The blind spot monitoring works well, plus the AEB in both forwards and reversing does indeed work. Personally, I think it's a pretty handsome vehicle in this color combination, although I would also consider the Merlot red or the satin blue. And the reason I bring up something so subjective is because a lot of people buy a Land Cruiser to keep for a long time, 10, 15, 20 years. So you wanna get the spec right. And that also extends to the trim grades because there are six of them from a relatively stripped out GX model that costs about $100,000 drive away through the GXL VX Sahara, Sahara ZX and the GR Sport. Now, I personally think the VX is the value buy in the range. It's still, I wouldn't call it affordable, but the price is maybe approachable and you get a lot of good features for the cash. It's really from this Sahara upwards where the 300 series starts to take a really big leap in terms of cost. And this trim is $18,000 more than the VX. However, if you do intend to keep the vehicle long-term, you probably will enjoy some of the extra creature comforts of the Sahara. Now you can get this beige interior in the Sahara, whereas the VX only has black, and the seats are genuine leather in this model compared to vinyl for the VX. You're still getting heated and cooled seats up front though, heated and cooled seats in the back, a heated steering wheel even as well. You don't know you need that until you've tried it on a cold morning. Sunroof, premium JBL stereo, and a cool box in the center. That feature only starts from the Sahara, and I have used it so much in my time driving these cars, I really appreciate it. You're also getting some cool stuff like sequential indicators on the Sahara level and above, dual rear seat entertainment. Don't know how many families really need that anymore with the proliferation of iPads, but it's out there. What about the rest of the interior? It's smartly laid out, but it's ultimately quite conservative. We've got a 12 inch touchscreen here, relatively low resolution. So CarPlay only gets a little bit of the screen and you've got to plug your phone in to an old school USB port, which feels a bit old fashioned. Looking forward, we've got analog gauges, handsome, and a customizable uh, digital screen in between. That's all good. Quick piano key access to the main features, even a CD player, which is a blast from the past. Lots of big dials, lots of switches and physical controls, which is absolutely awesome. And I prefer the interior to the Land Cruiser compared to the Lexus version of this car, the LX. Plus the seats are big, cushy, comfy, supportive. I've done more than a thousand Ks in this car in one day 
and been totally comfortable. So that's up front, let's check out the back seat. Jumping up here into the second row reveals a bit of an inconvenient truth for the Land Cruiser, and that's that despite being a relatively large vehicle, the packaging is actually only middling. It's a genuine full drive, and that means a lot of room has to be left over for genuine full drive stuff, including the frame chassis, which tends to drive up the floor plan quite a bit. But you can see for me at six foot, I certainly fit. Headroom is excellent, leg is pretty good, toe room is okay, but my legs are kind of floating here a bit much like they would be in an EV. So you've got to kind of splay your legs out in order to get comfortable. However, we do have all the toys back here. Those screens I was talking about. We've got big air vents here. We've got a separate climate zone for both seats. We've got seat cooling, we've got seat heating, USB ports, headphone and HDMI jacks, 12 volt socket. But the door skins are actually relatively hard as I found out when I tried to sleep on them in rural South Australia one time. But we do get a flip down armrest. We've got cup holders. It's generally pretty comfy. Now, this car actually does have three rows of seating. You only get three rows on the GXL, VX, and Sahara. Everything else is five seats. So I'm gonna clamber in the back and we'll see how it goes for adults. Unlike on the GXL and the VX though, the Sahara makes erecting the third row a lot easier because there are just buttons in the boot here. You have to hold them down the whole time for some reason, they're not one touch, but those seats very slowly and safely glide back towards you. And beautiful. Now I'm gonna get in. Well, you can tell that someone on the Land Cruiser team actually does have kids because it's the light, small passenger or curbside seat here in the right-hand drive market, it is Australia, that tumbles out of the way. So clambering into the back is gonna be doable for little kids. And once they get back here, they're gonna love it because they've got air vents, they've got USB chargers, and they've got cup hold as well. Now, for an adult, it's, I mean, you can see my legs, they're right up against my ears, basically. So it's not super comfortable, but for short trips, it's gonna do. I've got headroom, I've got leg room, which is more than you can say for a lot of three row vehicles. It's just that super high floor that causes a bit of a problem. But one thing I will say is actually about the beige. You might be thinking, my God, I could never live with that. It's not kid friendly. Well, this car has got 22,000 kilometers on it. That's a lot for a press demonstrator. A mentor of mine in this industry once said to get the true mileage of a press car add a zero to the end. So if this is what the interior would look like at 200,000, well, I'd be happy with that. Moving around the back of the Land Cruiser Sahara, well, everyone's gonna know that you bought the Sahara because it gets its own badge. This one does have a tow kit. Unfortunately, someone, uh, another journalist, another channel before me um, screwed it. So we can't do any towing in this video. But if we could, this car has a three and a half ton braked towing capacity which is impressive. It's also got a power tailgate, but only from this, does a lot of beeping, Toyota tailgates do that. Actually, only the Sahara and above gets a power tailgate. Even on the VX, which is not a cheap car, you're lifting this massive door by yourself. You might be able to do that, but can everyone in your family? Now, we've got these third row seats up here. We need to put those down. So that's a matter of dropping the headrests and then pressing these buttons. As you can see, we have to keep pressing them, have to hold them down. So yeah, you can sort of tell this mink cream carpeting in the boot is getting a little bit dirty here, but nothing serious and car journalists are not kind to press cars. So I actually think it's faring all right. We've got a household power point here, 220 volts, 100 watt. Underneath the floor, we've got the classic Toyota um, spare wheel toolkit because this vehicle has an underslung full size spare which definitely gives you peace of mind when touring. And we've got the buttons here to close the tailgate, or you can close the tailgate and lock the vehicle and just walk away. What about when it comes to rowing costs? Well, this is one area where the new V6 engine really pays dividends because the fuel consumption is really stunningly low for a vehicle this big and with relatively strong performance. So Toyota claims 8.9 litres per 100 Ks. I've driven nearly 10,000 kilometres in the new 300 series Land Cruiser and I've sat on 10 liters flat, which I think is pretty impressive for a combo of town, highway and country touring. Now the vehicle has a 110 liter fuel tank, a combination of a main tank and a sub. So that's gonna give you a driving range of over a thousand Ks, 1100 Ks to be exact, which is pretty darn impressive if you ask me. It says a warranty, Toyota has a five year unlimited warranty for this vehicle servicing i've got the numbers on screen now but it's kind of inconvenient because you still have to service a land cruiser 
every six months or 10,000 Ks, which is shorter than a lot of other vehicles on the road. And in terms of insurance, in the last 12 months, the median Budget Direct customer has spent $1,389 to comprehensively insure a new Toyota Land Cruiser. Everybody's situation varies and your premium will vary based on things insurers take into account, like where you live and your driving history. So that's my opinion of the Toyota Land Cruiser Sahara. Certainly not a perfect vehicle, it's got its flaws. The brakes could be better, some of the interior technology is already starting to get dated, and it's very, very expensive and hard to get one. But I still think this is one of the very best vehicles on the market and one of the only new cars that I would actually spend my own money on. Why? Because it's basically the Swiss army knife of vehicles. It'll take you just about anywhere on this continent You'll do it in good performance and in amazing air conditioned comfort and all of that without looking like you're too posh because it's just got such a different image to something like a Range Rover, doesn't it? I find it a very likable vehicle. And the fact that it's now actually quite good to drive in new 300 series guys is just icing on the cake. That's my opinion. You can let me know your view down below. Hit subscribe while you're there if you liked this video. The notification bell if you really, really liked this video. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.